Okay, so let's talk about cell walls today. Uh, I know what you're thinking, yay, cell walls, but uh, actually cell walls are uh, something that is near and dear to my heart. I spent uh, several years doing research on the bacterial cell wall, and uh, it turns out they're a lot more interesting than you might expect, because uh, cell walls, it turns out, are actually the target of the drug penicillin. So if you've ever had a bacterial infection, and if you've ever taken penicillin or some sort of other derivative such as ampicillin or cephalosporin or something like that, then uh, you've benefited from a biological understanding of the bacterial cell wall. So let's talk about cell walls and membranes and extracellular matrices and let's, uh, let's kind of talk about what these things are. So this is the first point is we've talked about membranes already. And uh, I want to compare what a membrane is to a cell wall, to the extracellular matrix, and making sure there's not any confusion between these things. So if you remember, our uh, cell membrane, uh, this is a phospholipid bilayer. It has some embedded proteins, and it's this barrier that encases the cell. Uh, there are membranes that encase various organelles, and these membranes might have uh, enzymes and transport proteins and uh, all sorts of other things going on with the membranes, all those things that we talked about. So the two big things, of course, about membranes are that they do encase the cell and that they are um, involved in transport of many, many different things uh, in and out of the cells. So what's a cell wall then? A cell wall is a layer outside of the membrane and it's more rigid. It's a lot like an actual wall. It has a shape, it's firm, and it's uh, protective. And uh, often what's really important about cell walls is it'll give a cell a shape. So you might know that plant cells are uh, kind of box shaped. And this is because of the cell wall. The cell wall itself is kind of box shaped. And that holds the plant cell into that box shaped uh, structure. And if it didn't have that, uh, plants would be a lot more floppy. Uh, and since they don't have skeletons or anything like that, they would, uh, they would be flopped all over the ground and that would be bad for the plant. So the last one there is the extracellular matrix. So what is that? The extracellular matrix is uh, something that is found uh, outside of some animal cells. Um, it's in some ways analogous to a cell wall and that sometimes it can be rigid and firm, but sometimes it's kind of floppy, uh, connective tissues, um, so it's something outside of an animal cell wall, and there's actually a variety of functions, and we'll talk about the extracellular matrix uh, in a few minutes. But let's talk about cell walls first. So let's talk about the plant cell wall. First thing I want to point out uh, right from this diagram is that the plant cell wall is not green. So what is green in the plant cell? The chloroplasts, of course. But hey, you know, the uh, artist here wanted to make it look pretty, so they made it green. Plant cell walls are actually usually kind of more white. Think of something like cotton. Um, that's what a plant cell wall is made out of, uh, basically cellulose, which is the same thing that's made of cotton. So I want to zoom in on this picture. And uh, what you're actually looking at is uh, three cells, okay? We have, we have cell one over here. So there's cell one. We have a second cell over here, and we have a third cell over there. So what they're trying to do is they're showing the junction of three cell walls uh, in this particular diagram. Notice right here, this here is the plasma membrane and the cell wall is outside of the plasma membrane. So like I said, a huge important thing for plants is it's protecting the cell from osmotic pressure and maintaining the cell shape. So I wanna kind of zoom in and take a look at uh, plant cell wall in a lot more detail. So it turns out a plant cell wall is made out of something called cellulose. So we talked about cellulose back in uh, topic two on macromolecules. And uh, I think I showed you this picture here and showed you that these glucose molecules are attached together and you know one is upside right and the next one is upside down and then the next one is upside right and the next one is upside down and so on. And uh, so what does that mean? It means that they have a very special kind of linkage. This is actually called a beta linkage. And uh, I showed you this other image, which is a bit more uh, a bit more representative of what's going on in three dimensions. And if you take a look at this dimension, this sort of upside right, upside down thing allows there to be all sorts of hydrogen bonds forming. So if you take a look, here's a hydrogen bond right here. I'll circle it. So they're shown in the dotted lines. So what is a hydrogen bond? 
um, you're probably thinking back to your uh, uh, chemistry 30 and you're thinking, okay, hydrogen bond, it's hydrogen, yes. Um, but what's going on with that hydrogen? Uh, this is really a strong dipole-dipole interaction is what's going on here. So if you take a look, uh, for example, uh, I'll draw a hydrogen bond between two water molecules. So there's a water molecule. And you probably know that water has these extra electrons and water is actually electronegative. So there's a the little symbol that's um, a Greek delta. And that little uh, symbol means partial negative charge or I think it looks a little bit like an S, so I think it's slightly negative. Here's another water molecule I'm gonna draw up here. So there we go. And this water molecule has a hydrogen, and that hydrogen is partially positive. So now, as you know, with chemistry, we have a partial positive charge and a partial negative charge, and, and you know what, those atoms like that. So here's my little dotted line showing the hydrogen bond. So it's a weak, charge, a weak intermolecular charge, but when you're something like cellulose and you have hundreds and thousands of these, uh, it actually adds up and now you're ending up with a relatively tough structure uh, that doesn't break down very easily. And this is great for a wall because a wall, you want it to be tough. Here's the image from the textbook, uh, not as nice as the one I just showed you, but you can see the little dotted line. So here's some hydrogen bonds here and here and so on, and they're trying to show that it's a tough structure and you've got all these strands and they form these fibers and, uh, and these fibers are the basis of the plant cell wall. So here's another picture showing the plant cell wall. And uh, if you take a look at these, um, I guess they're teal or, or turquoise, so I'll circle one here. That's the cellulose fibers. And uh, there are other things in there, inside the, the cell wall, besides cellulose. And you can see one of the other things here is pectin. So you're probably thinking pectin, pectin. We ever heard that before. Well, if you've ever made jam or jelly with your parents or your grandma, uh, pectin is the thing that you might add to the jam or jelly that kind of makes it jelly-like. So what is it? It's a protein, and it's kind, of, um, it's kind of a little bit like sticky glue. Right, so you've got all this cellulose there, which is kind of like rebar uh, in cement. So it's like these iron bars and the pectin is a little bit more like glue, just holding things together. But the cellulose is really the main thing that's, uh, that's uh, adding the uh, structural components to it. So notice the yellow thing at the bottom is the plasma membrane. I'll show you the picture from the cell mem or from the cell membrane, picture from the textbook. And here's the picture from the textbook. You can see on top there is a, um, uh, an electron micrograph, and on the bottom is the little cartoon showing again we've got the junction of, uh, of three cells. So notice they're, they're talking about some, some different things going on. We've got the uh, primary cell wall, we've got the secondary cell wall, and then we've got something called the middle lamella. So let's talk about that primary cell wall here. I'm going to try to draw you a little picture here, and uh, here's where I'm not having the, um, the whiteboard, is is not helping me here. But uh, I'll, I'll try to explain what is going on here. Is we have, uh, you can imagine we've got, you know, first we've got our plasma membrane. So PM is plasma membrane. And then we have some enzymes uh, that are found around the plasma membrane and they're gonna export some glucose and they're gonna make a little bit of cellulose on the outside. So here's my cellulose. I'll just kind of make it a zigzag. And this is my primary wall. Sorry if it just squeezed in there. And so this is, the, uh, this is the situation for a lot of plant cells. This is all they have here. But if you're kind of a bigger plant, so such as let's say a tree, uh, you are massive and you need extra support because you can imagine some trees are very, very tall. And uh, just a, a skinny little primary cell wall isn't enough. So they make a secondary cell wall. So what I'm going to do now is I've got a race kind of part of my picture there and, uh, and show you what happens with the secondary cell wall, but um, I'll try to squeeze it in and then I might have to do some erasing. But um, what happens is we've got the export of some more cellulose and now we're going to make an ex another cell wall here. And this one's going to be actually much thicker and we call that the secondary wall. So notice that the secondary wall is closer to the membrane. So let me erase that here. And uh, how do I erase here? There we go. I'm going to erase that. And there we go, and now we have 
So there's my plasma membrane there, PM. And now we have a secondary cell wall. Okay, for some reason, I think I'm just too close to the edge. There we go, secondary wall. So that's what they're trying to show you in the picture there. So you see, in CMA note, the primary cell wall, first day of growth, thin and flexible, and then there's this middle lamella, which is uh, kind of the space between the cells, and that's where um, the, uh, the two cells are kind of just basically being glued together. So there's some pectins in there, and there's a few other uh, glycoproteins that are kind of sticky and, and hold the, the cells together. So I think I have a note here for the secondary cell wall. There it is. It says between the cell wall, primary cell wall, and the membrane. And this includes things like wood. So sometimes we're also looking at other polymers. So there's a polymer actually called uh, uh, xylose, which is kind of similar to cellulose. Uh, and it's, it's found pretty commonly, in, um, pretty commonly in wood. So that's mostly it for the plant cell wall. There's one other feature I want to point out is this little thing down here listed at the bottom. It's called a plasmodesmata. And these are little channels between cells. So I know I have a picture here and you can see these channels are actually channels uh, right through the cytoplasm. So you probably know plants love water. That water has to diffuse all the way from, from the roots all the way up to the leaves. And if you want to speed things up, you just make channels for it. And so that's what these plasma desmana are all about. They're just uh, helping the diffusion of water go faster um, between the cells. So you can see there's a whole bunch shown there in that particular diagram. You can see we also have, um, so right there is the plasma membrane. And then right here, we've got a cell wall. And then in the middle, we've got that, um, uh, some pectin and uh, other cellular type glues holding the whole thing together. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of cell walls out there. Uh, I don't need you to know all of them, okay? Um, I do need you to know about the plant cell wall. Uh, so we just talked about that. Uh, there's a few others here on this list, and I have some notes, and I'll show you. I have some stars beside the ones that you really do need to know for this class. Animal cells, we need to know that. They have no cell wall, but they might have an extracellular matrix. We'll get back to that in a minute. Just, just hold on for a minute. Um, the bacterial cell wall is made of something called peptidoglycan. We've already talked about peptidoglycan and we will uh, more so uh, just in a minute. Uh, archaeal cells, uh, um, they might have a carbohydrate called pseudopeptidoglycan and some of them have something called S layers and I'll talk about them in a minute. Fungal cells have something called chitin and protists, there's a huge diversity in the protist kingdom. So which ones do you need to know? You need to know plant cell wall, which is not on this list, but we just talked about. You need to know what's going on with animal cells. You need to know what's going on with bacterial cells. And uh, for fungal cells, just know the word chitin. Um, archaeal cells and protist cells, uh, I'm going to talk about them a little bit, but uh, uh, I'm not going to test you on them on the midterm. So let's talk about the bacterial cell wall. Let's talk about peptidoglycan. Uh, like I said, this is something I did some research on uh, during my PhD. This is the target of uh, the drug penicillin and related, related drugs. Um, so if you take a look at this word, we have two components. We have peptido and we have glycan. So the glycan part, uh, we actually have two carbohydrates. We have this one here, N-acetylglucosamine or NAG, and the other one, N-acetylmeramic acid or NAM. Um, I won't ask you those words on a test, but what are they? They're basically glucose with a little bit of extra uh, functional groups on it. So if you take a look at the, uh, the NAG, we've got this nitrogen. So that's where the N for N-acetyl goes, and then we have an acetyl group. So N-acetyl glucosamine. Uh, N-acetylmeramic acid, you can see there's uh, some groups on it. It's also got an N-acetyl uh, uh, group here. And it also has uh, over here, this is the peptide component. So if you take a look at these things here, we have alanine, we have uh, glutamic acid. Um, this is a derivative of lysine. We have alanine and we have alanine. So we have a little peptide on there, which is the peptido for the peptide of glycan. So notice what's going on here is we have these glycan chains, kind of like cellulose, and then they're linked together 
um, using these peptides. So I'll show you another picture of this, and this is kind of a little cartoon showing you we've got the, uh, the glycan part, which is the uh, horizontal um, little uh, diamonds, and we've got the peptide part, which is the vertical little red uh, ovals. And so rather than having just these fibers that are kind of, uh, you know, one-dimensional, uh, now we have uh, really a three-dimensional covalent mesh. So peptide glycan is actually a very, very tough, tough molecule. And um, it's, um, it's good for bacteria because they're out there trying to survive in the environment. And it gives their cells protection and shape, just like the plant cell wall. So it turns out that when we look at the bacterial cell wall, there's actually two main types. And uh, this is distinguished through a procedure called the gram stain. And we're going to talk about the gram stain in the next unit in a lot more detail, and also next week's lab, so lab four. Uh, if you take a look at that diagram, there's two colors of bacterial cells. We've got purple ones and we've got pink ones. So what is going on there? Well, we've got these purple ones are called gram-positive cells, and these pink or reddish ones are called gram-negative cells. So take a look on the left at the gram-positives. Um, this looks a little bit more like a plant cell wall. We've got, you can see we've got a plasma membrane, and then uh, on the outside here, we've got this thick layer of um, of something that's called peptidoglycan. So peptidoglycan is, like I said, it's kind of similar to cellulose, just has that peptide stuff going on, which makes it an extra tough kind of uh, carbohydrate um, uh, layer. So that's the gram positive. The gram negative, you can see is a little different. It actually uh, has a two membrane system. So we have a plasma membrane, and then we have this other feature here called the outer membrane. And in the middle, Right here, we have the peptidoglycan. So it's kind of like a sandwich, a membrane sandwich, or a cell wall sandwich, however you want to think about it. Um, so I'll talk about gram negatives in a second. Let me show you some pictures. Uh, I have some other pictures of these things, I believe. Um, so yeah, there's some electron micrographs. On the left, you can see we have the gram positive. We've got the thick layer of peptidoglycan here. And on the left, we've got the thin layer of peptidoglycan sandwiched between two membranes. Uh, a friend of mine actually took these pictures, by the way. Uh, his name is Valerio, and uh, he um, was very good at electron microscopy. And so he took these pictures, and uh, they're in a whole bunch of textbooks now, which is kind of cool. So what's going on with these, these cell walls, uh, and why? what's with the purple and the pink stuff? We're going to talk about that more in the lab and also uh, in topic, uh, topic five in this course. Uh, but very simply what's going on is the gram-positive cells uh, take up a stain called crystal violet. So that's why it's purple, because the stain is purple. Or uh, um, That's why I have it labeled purple, because the stain is purple. Crystal violet, violet, of course, means purple. Uh, the gram-negative cells, when you try to stain them with the purple, it uh, kind of sticks, but not really well. It actually washes away really easily, so they don't stain purple. Uh, so we, uh, we add in another type of stain in there called saffron and red, which gives a pinkish reddish color. And so in the end, we end up with uh, two types of uh, cells, um, two types of bacterial cells, which uh, represents uh, structural differences in their cell walls. So here's some pictures of some bacterial cells. Uh, there is bacillus anthra anthracis on the left, which causes anthrax. We've talked about anthrax already. Uh, it is gram positive, so it stains purple. And on the right is E. coli. E. coli is gram negative, and we're going to talk a lot about E. coli in the next unit. It stains pink or red, so it's gram negative. So more on more on the gram stain uh, coming. So there's just kind of a quick introduction to it. Uh, there's another diagram. This one's from the textbook. Uh, I think actually it's from one of the old editions, and you can actually see. Uh, uh, at least three different types of cells on there. You can see the, the darker purple and the lighter uh, pink ones. Uh, sometimes when you're taking the photos, they turn out, uh, you know, the pink actually looks a little purplish and all that, but you can see that the gram positive, it's a really dark kind of purplish, bluish color. Uh, and usually you can, you can distinguish that if you've, if you've seen enough of these samples. Okay, so a little bit more about the gram negatives because they're kind of something that you may have not seen before. They're kind of unique. Um, they've got a double membrane system. This is, this is very unique in general. And there's a couple of things I want to point out that is unique about the gram-negative uh, cells here. Um, 
First is that the outer membrane actually has a very unique lipid in it. It's called, uh, you can see the whole term there, lipopolysaccharides. Um, usually people call these LPS molecules. And uh, these are a very distinct type of lipids. In fact, they're actually kind of dangerous, these lipids. If you end up with a bacterial blood infection and uh, these cells break open, the, these lipids, when they, when they get into your blood, um, our immune system kind of goes a little crazy, gets excited and says, hey, wait a second, this, there's something here, it's not human. And so when it recognizes those LPS molecules, it, um, it, it can have, you can have an immune reaction. And that's why one reason why bloodborne uh, infections are very, very dangerous, people getting bacteria in the blood. Uh, what happens? So, you know, you, best case scenario, you get lower blood pressure and maybe you're tired. Uh, worst case scenario, it can, can cause an extreme immune reaction, which can lead to uh, uh, a very severe illness or, or death and organ failure. Uh, so these, these are something that are very important medically, these LPS molecules. Uh, something else that's unique is we kind of have um, this little special zone, the zone between the two membranes. It's called the periplasm. Uh, so what's going on in the periplasm is very skinny. Uh, you've got the peptidoglycan there, obviously. And the other thing that is going on in the periplasm, and this is, there are a few enzymes and a few other uh, uh, molecules in there. And, and why do we care about the periplasm? Because some of these enzymes are involved in antibiotic resistance. So it turns out that gram negatives are more resistant to drugs than gram positives, kind of on general. Um, you know, just as a general kind of uh, sense because of that extra protection, so the uh, outer membrane, and because of the periplasm that has uh, some enzymes in there that can break down certain types of drugs. So worth knowing a little bit about. Okay, so that's it for now for cell walls of bacteria. I just wanted to mention a few other cell walls. Like I said, I want to talk about our KL cells. Um, so the archaea are a separate domain, they're different from bacteria, and they do not have peptidoglycan. Some of them do have this little thing here called pseudopeptidoglycan. So you can look that up if you want, I can show you the chemical structure if you like, um, but it's, it's actually a different carbohydrate. Um, if you don't know a lot about biochemistry, you may look at it and take a quick glance and it kind of looks like peptidoglycan, but the linkages are actually a little bit different. And, um, and so it's, it's a considered a separate chemical structure. Uh, so it's not peptidoglycan, so just they call it pseudo or fake peptidoglycan. Um, other RKL cells may have something called S layers. So S here, by the way, stands for surface. I don't know why they don't just call them surface layers, but hey, I didn't name it. Uh, and these are actually crystalline proteins. And you can see there's a, an electron micrograph showing some crystalline proteins on uh, that kale cell. So what about fungi? Fungi have chitin. Chitin uh, takes the place of cellulose. Very, very similar compound, chitin. Chitin is actually made out of NAG or N-acetylglucosamine. So that was the same thing we saw in the peptidoglycan, N-acetyl. Uh, I can't spell. Let me just go back and get rid of that Y. How do I use the eraser? Oh no. Ah, okay. Let me try that again. I'll just write down here. And acetylglucosamine. It's not easy writing on this screen. I apologize. I, my handwriting is usually much, much better than that, but uh, just not, uh, not as neat and tidy as I'd like it to be. So you don't need to know NAG or N-acetylglucosamine, but you de do need to know the word chitin. And chitin is made out of N-acetylglucosamine. Uh, very similar to cellulose. It's got all those hydrogen bonds. Um, these cell walls also have other things in there, these proteins that are kind of like pectins and they're sticky. Um, but like I said, mainly I just want you to know the word chitin and that chitin is the, uh, uh, the carbohydrate component of the fungal cell wall. So what about protists? Um, so protists, remember, are that catch-all group that basically mean they're eukaryotes and they're not plants or fungi or animals. Uh, and so there's a huge variety of what is going on there. Many don't have cell walls. Uh, some of them actually have cellulose and chitin. And then there's a whole bunch of other weird uh, carbohydrates out there. Uh, some don't even have carbohydrates, they're using proteins. 
Um, these ones that I'm showing on the bottom are actually made out of uh, minerals. These are calcium carbonate and silica minerals. And, and so there's a lot of weird things going on with protists. That's kind of the theme about protists, by the way. Lots of weird things going on because they're such a huge, diverse group of, of, uh, of organisms. Okay, so the last part that, uh, of this unit is I wanted to talk about the extracellular matrix. So what is that? Um, this is a, um, these are some, some macromolecules and they're found outside of some animal cells. So if you take a look here, uh, this is showing the extracellular matrix of this cell and you've got these, um, these proteins and these glycoproteins. So there's collagen and fibronectin. So what, what is collagen part of? Well, it's in your skin and it's kind of what's making your skin sort of bouncy and, and uh, you know, flexible. And uh, so you can think of collagen as really a big part of connective tissue. And so it's not uh, strong like a cell wall and then it's firm, it's a lot more flexible, but it is in some ways kind of having a similar function, right? In this case, in this case we're talking about uh, connective tissue. Um, I think I have some other slides here. No, I don't have any other slides on, on extracellular matrix, but I wanna give you three examples of extracellular matrix. So that was example one. I'll just write it on the slide here. Example one, we'll call it connective tissue. And uh, so somebody was just at the door. So example two is bone. So bone cells, um, I'll draw a little picture here up in the top. You can see there's my little cell. There's a little nucleus. There's another bone cell, little nucleus. So bone cells have huge spaces in between. And then what's in between, we have these calcified minerals. And these calcified minerals are, of course, very hard. And that is actually very analogous to a cell wall. Third example I will give you is something similar to bone. So something that you have in the end of your nose and your ears, a little more floppy than bone. And that is cartilage. So cart. Cartilage, hmm, I think there's an A there. Sorry about my spelling. I used to be able to spell, I've just lost that talent over the last few years for some reason. Okay, so um, I know I have some notes here on cell junctions and those kind of things. Don't really want to talk about them, they're kind of boring. Uh, these are things that are holding cells together, basically. Uh, maybe you'll see them in other classes in the future. And uh, you can see I have a little table here that you can uh, fill in for study purposes. I'm not going to do that in class. Maybe I'll do this uh, when we review for the midterm. Um, but take a look. It's important to know the differences between a membrane and a cell wall and an extracellular matrix and, and no examples and the kind of uh, macromolecules that make up each of these. Okay, so I am going to uh, switch gears here. If there are any questions, of course, always let me know. Uh, you can always add them in the chat function. And um, I'm going to go to topic five. Uh, let me see here. Just got to switch to the topic five PowerPoint. So topic five, we're going to talk about prokaryotic cells. So uh, like I said, this is an area I know a lot about because I've done a lot of research on this. And um, we're going to talk a lot about bacteria, a little bit about archaea, and uh, a bunch of other things such as E. coli. So today, mostly, we're going to kind of cover an introduction to prokaryotes. And uh, I'm hoping to talk a little bit about um, archaea as well today. And then uh, we'll continue on, of course, on Wednesday. So first thing about prokaryotes is I want to share some numbers with you because uh, there's really just some amazing, mind-blowing numbers. Okay, so take a look at these numbers I have here. First number is 5,400. So that is what we estimate to be the number of species of mammals. So here's something else crazy about that number. About a thousand of those species are bats. I know you're thinking, wow, there are really that many bats out there? Yeah, yeah, there are lots of species of bats. They're all over the place. We just don't see them because they're flying around at the nighttime. Um, but uh, anyway, maybe, maybe up to 6,000, but that many species of mammals. So what's that 10,000? 10,000, that is the number of species of microbes uh, if you get yourself a scoop of, uh, of fertile soil. And that's representing billions and billions, possibly trillions of microorganisms, uh, most of them being, being prokaryotes. 
So huge, huge numbers. So what's 4,000? Uh, that's about the number of species that we've actually been able to characterize biologically. And we think that there may be up to maybe 4 million types of prokaryotes out there. Um, we don't know. It's kind of hard to count that high sometimes. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll have a, a, you know, with all these genome studies and whatnot going on, maybe we'll have a better idea someday uh, of what that exact number is. Uh, here's some other numbers for you. So 30 to 40 trillion. Okay, that's a lot of zeros. That's a one with 14 zeros. Uh, what does that represent? That's the number of cells in the human body um, and a very similar number. Okay, so you can see slightly larger, 35 to 60 trillion. Uh, that's the number of bacterial cells uh, in your body. So we're looking at uh, cells on your skin, in your mouth, and the majority of them, of course, are in your digestive tract, in your intestines. Um, but we're talking about a huge number of cells. So, you know, biologically, you are half human and half prokaryote in some ways. Uh, if you just take a look at the sheer amount of genetic material, uh, there's actually more genes in those bacterial cells than in your, your entire genome by far, because we're representing hundreds, if not thousands of species. So they're very numerous, these things. What else can we say about prokaryotes? Um, they are very abundant. They seem to be found uh, pretty much everywhere on the planet that we look. Uh, you know, in the dirt, in old mines and waters, we found them in nuclear reactors. Uh, and uh, they're very, very abundant. Uh, possibly they represent as much biomass as all the other species out there, including the trees, which is really remarkable. Uh, we don't know. It's really hard to count these things. You know, people have tried to estimate and, and you know, really honestly, their guess is as good as mine um, because there's so many things to think about. If you think about what's going on in the oceans, if you think about what's going on in the ground and those kind of things. So prokaryotes, of course, uh, have no nucleus and they include the bacteria and the archaea. So I wanted to um, segue here, and I wanted to make some notes about the, um, I wanna take, make some notes about uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So I've started making this table here, and uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, I'm gonna fill some things into this table, and um, some of these things we haven't talked about yet. Some of these things we won't talk about yet for a few weeks. Um, but uh, I'm hoping you come back to this table because this is one of the big themes of the course is understanding what is going on between different cell types and um, understanding, you know, okay, this is what's going on in bacteria. This is what's going on in eukaryotes. This is what's going on in plants versus animals, etc. cetera. Uh, in some cases, the answer is it's happening in all cell types. In some cases, it's happening in some cell types. So let's take a look at this. Like I said, I kind of want to fill in some notes here and, uh, and compare these organisms. And, uh, you know, if you don't understand everything that I'm putting in the notes yet, that's fine because we will probably get to it at some point. Um, so first thing you can see, uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes, what do they include? So we we're just talking about what the prokaryotes are, and that includes the bacteria and the archaea. And the eukaryotes, we have animals, plants, Fungi, those are the usual ones that we think about. We also have the protists. And I'm gonna put in brackets the algae. Uh, sometimes people will consider algae uh, its own thing. Sometimes people group it with the protists. I usually group it with the protists because there are many, many photosynthetic protists. Um, why are algae not plants? Uh, well, they're not as complex as plants. Plants are, are multicellular, they have organs. Uh, they, they have roots, uh, algae generally don't. Uh, and um, sometimes they do some weird things. They have flagella, they're motile. Things like that. So what are some typical sizes of these things? Uh, as we talked about in unit one, a big difference between them is the usual sizes. So uh, prokaryotes, typical size is one to five micrometers. So if you remember the, uh, the symbol, that we use for micrometer. Uh, where is that? Insert symbol, there we go. I'll stick that in, there it is. Here's that little letter. That is a Greek letter, it's the mu, and that's how we show micrometer. 
Okay, typical size of eukaryotic cells uh, kind of depends on the type of cell. Uh, animal cells on average tend to be smaller than plant cells. The smallest uh, eukaryotic cells tend to be around uh, 10 or 20 micrometers. I'll put 20. Uh, largest cells could be as big as 1,000 micrometers, and some are actually much larger. Um, we actually have, uh, in, in humans, there's a neuron that basically goes from your hip all the way to the, uh, the end of your toe. And so depending on your height, that, that cell is about a meter in length. But uh, again, that's not typical. There's always exceptions in biology, but you know, what is typical is kind of what I'm trying to put down here. Uh, Membrane-bound nucleus. So prokaryotes, no. That is the big difference. Always mention that as a difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes, because of course that is the defining feature. It's right in the name. Eukaryote means true nucleus. Prokaryote means before nucleus, meaning no nucleus. It's more primitive, is, is the idea. Uh, other membrane-bound organelles, prokaryotes are no, and eukaryotes are yes. Now this is kind of a finicky area because there are always exceptions. Uh, red blood cells, for example, in eukaryotes don't have uh, a nucleus, um, but they had one when they were younger. They kind of just as they mature, they lose a lot of organelles. Um, so again, exceptions. And there are some features in prokaryotes that some people would sort of call as, as uh, membrane-bound organelles, but uh, generally no. Um, prokaryotes don't have a Golgi body or an endoplasmic reticulum, um, even though sometimes they might have weird uh, features. So we're just talking about cell walls. So we'll fill in that information here. So remember animals, the answer is no cell wall. For animals, they might have an extracellular matrix if you wanna add that as a, as a point. Uh, plants, of course, have cellulose. And we have fungi, which have a carbohydrate called chitin. And then protists, we said, have a huge diversity. we go. For some reason it's telling me that huge and diversity are spelled wrong. I see what happened. For some reason my document decided to switch to being French. I don't know why that happened. Let's see if I can switch it back. Okay, and what about the bacteria in archaea? So bacteria, remember the word you just learned, the peptidoglycan and archaea. Some of them have pseudopeptidoglycan. And some of them have these things called S layers. Okay, so I think at this point, all, all that stuff is not new. Uh, maybe the sizes are new, but we've already talked about, you know, uh, organelles, yes or no, nucleus, yes or no, and we just talked about cell walls. So I want to talk about a, a few other features that are going to come up uh, in the next few lectures, and, and some of the features will come up uh, kind of a little bit later on in the course. Uh, what is going on with the DNA, for example, and by DNA, I mean the genome. So I'm just gonna add some bullet points here, is that bacteria and archaea usually have um, a single chromosome, and that chromosome is usually circular. So you can kind of think of it as a giant hula hoop, but maybe something a little more accurate would be, would be um, uh, more like a rubber band that's been sort of twisted and folded up. So well, eukaryotes, it's the opposite, usually have multiple chromosomes and they're usually linear. So big linear uh, chunks of DNA. Uh, what else can we say about, um, uh, about the DNA? Is the DNA in prokaryotes is, we'll call it naked. What do I mean by naked? It means um, the opposite of what's going on in eukaryotes, which uh, eukaryotes is bound to proteins. So, and these proteins are called histone proteins. So, uh, those histone proteins aren't found in, in bacteria anyway. Once in a while, they're found in archaea, but as a general uh, note, they're not. Uh, we can say we've got a smaller genome in prokaryotes, smaller genomes by quite a bit and much larger genomes in eukaryotes. And 
I guess that's it for DNA for now. Uh, I have a couple other notes. So ribosomes in prokaryotes are smaller, and the size we're calling the 70S. I'll talk about what that means uh, probably next lecture. Uh, the ones in eukaryotes are larger, and they're called ADS. So that's the size. That's a, a unit called a Svedberg unit, and we'll talk about that in, in coming lectures. Uh, reproduction. So you probably know that uh, uh, eukaryotes, we have these things called mitosis and meiosis. And uh, eukaryotes, again, depending on, you know, what you are, if you're uh, some fungi or plants, you know, they can, they can reproduce asexually. And uh, many organisms, such as humans, also reproduce sexually. So what does that mean? It means we're uh, exchanging uh, uh, gametes, right? Uh, bacteria, they do something that we call binary fission. So we'll talk about that next day, what that is. And they're pretty much all asexual. In fact, I don't know if there's any examples of any bacteria that reproduce sexually. Uh, they do sometimes have a, a process called DNA exchange. And uh, we'll talk about what that, that is uh, next day. But the process is called conjugation. Okay. So one more category there I have for you. And, um, and I'm hoping to have a little bit of time to talk about archaea as well. Uh, so uh, I had uh, shown you a previous slide uh, of something called a flagella. And uh, this is something we'll be talking about um, in the coming lectures. But uh, bacteria have flagella rotate. So these flagella are kind of like, uh, you can think of them as boat propellers. Whereas eukaryotes have flagella that are like whip-like. So if you think of, um, if you think of like a sperm cell, it's got a big tail. And it's kind of like a big whip. And some of them have something called cilia as well. So more on that later. And uh, some of these uh, um, uh, eukaryotic cells have something called, you know, they're, they're amoeba and they have something called amoeboid movement. Okay, so I'm hoping everybody got all that. Um, these are all, all things we're going to talk about, and we'll talk about many more things that, uh, 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 that are going on with eukaryotes and prokaryotes. This is kind of just a place to get started to, to think about these things and what is going on and why they're different biologically. So, like I said, hopefully you got all that. Uh, if you missed something, I uh, can go back and watch the, uh, the lecture video. Um, and uh, or you can always uh, give me a call or send me an email and get, get a hold of me and, and I'd love to talk to you about bacteria. Talk about bacteria for a long, long time. <laughs> okay, so back to our prokaryotes. There's our two cells. You can see the eukaryote has the big nucleus and the prokaryote does not have a nucleus. Uh, but it does have a membrane and the cell wall. So I showed you this picture before. This was featuring the three domains. So we have the archaea, and we have the uh, eukaryotes and the bacteria. So let me just take a look at the time here. So I have a few minutes to talk about the archaea, and um, I'm actually going to make a note again on um, on Word uh, and, and write a few notes about the archaea. I'll show you this picture here first. Um, some of these archaea are found in some really unique environments. Um, what we're looking at here, this is a hot spring found in a park, and the water here is uh, 90 degrees Celsius, which is too hot for pretty much anything to live, uh, except for archaea. Bacteria, there are some extremophile bacteria, but 90 degrees is too hot for them. Um, so you can stick a uh, microscope slide in there, and, and people find these organisms, and, and they study them. Uh, some textbooks used to say these things are all extremophiles, and that's not true. We find archaea pretty much everywhere where we look, uh, in, the, in the soil and in plants and all sorts of other things. Here's a little cartoon for you. You can see, you know, she's talking to a friend, and she says, my favorite part of Ghostbusters is when, and then something embarrassing happens. And the cartoon says, don't be embarrassed. It's not your gas. It's your archaea. So some of them are producing methane. And so methane is part of our flatulence. So that's fun. <laughs> okay, so I told you I wanted to write a few notes about the archaea. And so I'm just going back to this Word document. I just started a second page here, notes on archaea. So I wanted to say a few things about them um, and, uh, and then probably won't talk about them again. And there's some, some good reasons why we don't know a ton about them. 
But here are some things that we do know about them. So they are prokaryotes, remember that means no nucleus. And they are a separate domain. Remember, they're a separate domain from, um, from the bacteria and the eukaryotes. So that's important to know. I'm just gonna fix this here. Okay, uh, what else can we say about them? We've already talked about their membranes. They have unique membrane lipids. Remember that we had those, some of them were branched, some of them were monolayers. So there's lots of unique chemistry around these things. So maybe that would be my next point is that they have uh, several unique genes and metabolic pathways. So that means they do all sorts of interesting chemical things that are not found in the bacteria and are not found in the eukaryotes. Uh, one of those is making method, uh, methane. So some are methanogens. And that means they make methane. And that is unique. We don't have bacteria that do that and we don't have any eukaryotes that do that. Um, I mentioned that some are extremophiles. So for example, they live in very hot environments, like hot springs. Um, they are found almost everywhere. Other organisms are found. And the last note is that there are no known pathogens. So there's two reasons why we don't know as much about archaea than we do about other organisms. Number one is that many of them grow very, very slowly in the lab. So E. coli, I could make, a, I could inoculate a test tube and I could have a culture tomorrow very easily. Um, many archaeal organisms you're looking at, it takes six months to grow a test tube. Um, so why would you do that as a researcher? It just takes too long, it's too slow. And the other reason is there are no known pathogens. So what does that mean? It means none of them, as far as we know, none of them make us sick. Uh, and so that means there's a lot less uh, grant money to study these things. None of them are making us sick. Um, you know, uh, all, the, all the medical grants and those kind of things are not going to be applicable to, to these, uh, these organisms because, uh, uh, well, you know, what, what's the point? Uh, another point, obviously, it's very interesting to study biologically, but uh, just a little bit harder to get money to study these. Okay, so I realize we're almost done for the day. I'm just going to see what the next slide is and uh, probably finish there. Um, so yeah, I'm going to finish there with the archaea and uh, we'll pick up and we'll start talking about bacteria next day. So uh, happy Monday everybody and uh, I hope you have a great week and um, We'll see you on Wednesday.